Greetings, fellow Hoovians. It. Wait. Like, why am I wearing this scarf? And. Oh, I seem to be wearing a hat for some reason. Oh, yeah, that's right! Because today I'm starting my reviews of the era of my favorite doctor, the fourth doctor, as played by Peter Capaldi. Nah, just kidding. I'm, of course, talking about Tom Baker. Duh. So, anyway. Let's take a look at the first doc I mean the fourth doctor's first story robot. Okay. <clears throat> Following his third regeneration, the doctor briefly becomes delirious and the falls unconscious in front of Sarah Jane Smith and Brigadier Lefford Stewart of Unit. The Brigadier has Lieutenant Harry Sullivan take the doctor into his care. Soon the doctor awakes, eludes Harry, and tries to sneak off in his TARDIS, but the Brigadier and Sarah Jane stop him convincing him to help in finding the culprit in the theft of top-secret plans for a disintegrator gun. The Brigadier takes the Doctor to the Ministry of Defense Advanced Research Center where the plans were stored, where the Doctor observes crushed flowers and a rectangular footprint. Hmm, that's weird. The unit sits to protect factories where critical parts for the gun are manufactured, but find the culprit is able to outwit them, including burrowing up underground to collect the final component necessary for the weapon. Dun dun dun! Meanwhile, Sergei investigates the National Institute for, Sci for Advanced Scientific Research, colloquially known as the Think Tank. There, she finds that Director Hilda Winters and her assistant, Arnold Jellicoe, are developing a robot, experimental prototype robot K-1, to be, used in to be used to perform tasks in hazardous locations in place of humans. Sergei learns that K-1 was originally built by Professor J.P. Kettlewell, a former member of the Think Tank who has now turned his sights on alternative energy. Nice. Kettlewell attests that he had disassembled K-1 after finding its thought processes were growing too quickly, and further asserts that Winters, Jellicoe, nor anyone at the think tank have the capacity to program it correctly, and that if they have tampered with its programming, the robot is likely suffering an existential crisis. Oh no! Robot is exciting. Oh no! A robot is suffering is an existential crisis! Ah! Sergei takes sympathy on the robot. Why? Later, K-1 appears at Kettlewell's residence and attempts to kill him, but when the Doctor, Sarah Jane, and Unit arrive, the robot becomes confused and escapes. Unknown to Unit, Winters and Jellico have instructed K-1 to kill cabinet member Joseph Chambers as an enemy of humanity and to use the completed disintegrator gun to steal papers from his personal safe. Unit discovers this death, and the Brigadier explains the importance of Chambers. The stone papers were launch codes for the nuclear weapons of the major nations, given voluntarily to British as a, as a neutral entity to only be released in the time of great need. Further, Winters, Jellico, and others of the think tank are found to be members of the Scienti Scientific Reform Society, seeking to put scientists in charge of the world believing they can make better decisions for humanity than, for humanity than the current governments. Yeah, I know a current, current government that cover them. Yeah, I know a current government that could definitely use something like that. Learning of a reform meeting that night, Unit prepares to move out, while Sarah Jane, after discovering Cuttawall is also a member, convinces him to go to the meeting to allow her to sneak into it. At the meeting, Sarah Jane is stunned to learn that Cuttawall was the mastermind behind the plot. Dun dun dun! He had rebuilt K-1 with Winters and Jellico so as to get the launch codes to force humanity to change its ways and a feigned K-1's attack at his home. K-1 discovers Sarah Jane's presence, and Winters, order, and Winters orders K-1 to kill her. Kettleball had never expected to put Sarah Jane in harm, and realizes Winters is more vicious than he originally thought. Gee, you think? When Unit arrives, Winters, Jellico, Kettleball, and K-1 escape with Sarah Jane as their hostage. Harry, having entered the think tank under the guise of medical inspections, sees the group enter a bunker and warns Unit before he is captured. Winters sends a list of demands to the world governments and gives them 30 minutes to comply, and subsequently orders Kettlewell to connect the launch computers and prepare to send the launch codes. Kettlewell, who never expected their plan to go to, the, to get to this stage, hesitates, and in the ensuing discussion, Sarah Jane and Harry attempt to escape with Kettlewell's assistance. Winters orders K-1 to stop the pair, but the robot, already conflicted to his programming, inadvertently fires the disintegrator gun at Kettlewell, killing him. The death, of, the death of its creator puts K-1 in a further confused state, falling to the ground and apparently shutting down. 
Do -do 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 -do. What is attempts to discontinue attempts to program the countdown? But the doctor arrives and successfully counters it. Hooray! As unit forces take Winters and Jellico away, K1 reactivates and begins to attack unit. K1 seeks out Sarah Jane to protect her. As a result of an Oedipus complex, it developed some from <coughs> Sarah Jane's previous compassion, according to the doctor. Okay then. Unit fires the disintegrator gun at the robot, but the blast is absorbed, causing the robot to grow to an enormous size. Alrighty then. We really see the growth is due to the living metal that Kettlewell used in constructing K1. The doctor raises back to Kettlewell's lab to, synth to synthesize a batch of metal biodegradable virus, a side discovery made by Kettlewell. The doctor throws a bucket of solution containing the virus onto K1, and the robot slowly shrinks down in size before it vanishes. Whew! As they regroup at back, as they regroup back at unit headquarters, Sarah Jane is saddened by the loss of K1. The doctor offers to cheer her up with a trip of the TARDIS, extending the invitation to Harry as well. The TARDIS dematerializes just as the Brigadier comes to the laboratory, and first about letting Buckingham Palace know that their guests will be late for a celebratory dinner. Aww, that's sad. Well, anyway, let's get some production elements of this story, shall we? As the Doctor was transitioning from the third to fourth incarnations, changes were also occurring in the production department of Doctor Who. Longtime producer Bray West is leaving the series, but will stay on to cast the new part of the Doctor as well as produce the first story, Robot. Let's will be succeeded for the next story by incoming producer Philip Hinchcliffe. Veteran script editor Terrence Dix was also leaving the series, being replaced by new script editor Robert Holmes. Holmes had been a writer for the show since season six, having penned several stories including The Crotons, The Space Pirates, and Spear from Space, the third Doctor's first serial. Though Dix was leaving as a script editor, he was still being involved with the series as a writer and had previously helped write the serials The Seas of Death and The War Games, and it would be Dix who would write the first story for the for the incoming fourth Doctor. Robot was written by Terence Dix, who would join the series in 1968 as assistant script editor and took over the script editor position soon after. Dix stated that a major influence for the story was King Kong. The initial script was written before Tom Baker had been cast as the fourth Doctor, and there was some discussion of returning to an older actor. This, require have, this would have required a younger character to handle the action scenes, so the character of Harry Sullivan was created. This was Sullivan's debut story, but he had been mentioned in the final episode of the preceding serial when the Brigadier telephoned him, requesting medical help for the Doctor. Dix included a number of elements from the Third Doctor's transition story, Spear from Space, including the Doctor being disoriented after regeneration, going to hospital to recover, escaping from hospital hospital gown, which led to costume change for the Doctor, having viewed himself in the mirror to see the change, and storing the TARDIS key in his shoe. These elements helped the audience with the transition between actors. Nice. It was known beforehand that John Pertwee would be leaving his role as the third Doctor, and that a new fourth Doctor would need to be cast for the part. Tom Baker was an out-of-work actor who would be working in construction at the time. Baker had been a television and film actor, having major parts in several films including Nicholas and Alexandra and The Vault of Horror. He had written to Bill Slater, the head of serials at the BBC, asking for work. Slater suggested Baker to Doctor Who producer Barry Letts, who had been looking to fill the part. Letts had been the producer of this series since the early Pertwee serials in 1970. He had seen Baker's work in The Golden Voyage of Sinbad and hired him for the part. Baker would continue in his role as a doctor for seven seasons, longer than any other actor to play the part. Ha! Take that, David Tennant! Elizabeth Slayton had renewed her contract to play Sarah Jane during the previous season. Nicholas Courtney and John Levine reprised their roles as Brigadier Leftwich Stewart and Sergeant Benton, respectively. Levine had started his role with the Second Doris Doctor of the Invasion as a member of the military organization UNIT, the United Nations Intelligence, the United Nations Intelligence Task Force. Courtney started a year earlier in the Web of Fear, with its character's rank being a colonel. They, along with Slayton, would be the transition to cast to carry through from the third Doctor to the fourth Doctor. This would be the only unit story for the twelfth season. The Earth-based stories involving the unit that had dominated the third Doctor's period on the show were an effort to reduce production costs by Peter Bryant and Derek Sherwin, the show's previous producer and script editor. This effort had been scrapped during the third Doctor's run by producer Barry Letts and script editor Terrence Dix, who were le just leaving the series as Baker was taking his role as the fourth Doctor. Edward Burnham portrays the wild-haired, bespe bespectacled boffin Professor Kettlewell, 
creates the titular K-1 robot. Along with Courtney Levine, Burnham had also played a part in the invasion where he had the role of Professor Watkins, another scientist-type character. The part of the K-1 robot is played by Michael Kil Kilgariff, who had played another robotic part in the 1967 story The Tomb of the Cybermen, where he had the part of the Cyberman controller. Patricia Maynard is cast in the part of Miss Hilda Winters, the director of the National Institute for, Scientific, for Advanced Scientific Research. Miss Winters' assistant, Arnold Jellico, is played by Alec Linstead. Linstead played the part of Sergeant Osgood, a member of the technical staff at unit in the 1971 serial The Daemons. This was the first Doctor Who serial to have its location material shot entirely on OB videotape, as opposed to the more usual BBC television drama practice of the time of shooting studio interiors on videotape and location exteriors on film. This was due to the large number of video effects involving the eponymous robot required in exterior scenes shot at the then BBC Engineering Training Department of Whitnord and Worcestershire, which were easier and more convincing to marry to videotape than to film. The team had been learning that lesson during the previous season's Evasion of the Dinosaurs. The Whitnord facility was chosen for the location shooting because it had an underground bunker which director Christopher Barry felt would be suitable for the entrance to the underground complex in the story. However, they refused permission to shoot in that area. Aww. So, yeah. Overall, a pretty interesting start to the fourth Doctor's run. And, hey, it's got homage to one of my favorite movies, King Kong. So, overall, I give Robot 4 out of 5 Sonic Screwdrivers. Well, join me next time as we as we go into the arc in space. So, until next week, this is Hoovy and Queen saying, Oh my giddy aunt, when I say run, run, I have a risk polarity of the neutron flow. Would you like a jelly baby? Fantastic. Allons-y, Geronimo! Bowties are cool, fences are cool, and Stetsons are cool. <laughs>